To get started with sample mounting for the SEM, you will need out of the cabinet this black height gauge, you need the base for the sample stage, the locking ring, and one of the two posts, either the short post or the long post. You will then need a suitable sample stage, so you need either this flat plate or a pin stub mount. If you're using the pin stub mount, you also need this Allen key. You of course need your samples, preferably mounted on pin stubs as this makes sample mounting much more easy for you. And then you might need some other tools such as some tweezers, stub tweezers, and then we have carbon tape and scissors for you as well. So to mount your holder, use uh, your sample using the pin stub holder. We're going to take the pin stub holder, your sample already mounted on a pin stub, drop it into one of the holes, and then with the Allen key, insert it into the grub screw and gently tighten it until you feel resistance. Once you feel resistance, do not over tighten this, just a finger tight to make sure that the grub screw holds, on, holds onto the pin stub. If you feel brave, you can of course turn it upside down to make sure that your sample does not fall off and the pin stub does not fall out. Next what you'll need to do is you need to take one of the posts, either the long post or the short post. If you're using the pin stub holder with a pin stub and a sample on top of it, you must use the short post. Take the short post and the locking ring, screw the post into the ring first, and then take the base and screw the post into the base. Then you can gently lock the post with the locking ring. Take the pin stub holder, make sure that the threads align, and be a bit careful here because it's quite delicate to get it to engage, but once it's engaged, rotate it gently until you feel it contact. And then again, do not use force, just gently finger tight, such that this will not rotate on the post. Next, you wanna place the entire assembly onto the checking gauge. Place the sample underneath this top part of the gauge, unlock the locking ring, and then rotate the sample holder so that it increases its height on the post. Rotate it and look at the side, look from the side and make sure that the sample surface sits within about one millimeter of this surface. If it's more than one millimeter, that is okay. But if it's within or close to this surface, you're in danger of contacting the instrument. So you should keep this surface one millimeter or more away from the sample. Once you've set the height, hold it in place and lock the locking ring. If you instead took the long post, put this into the locking ring, then into the base and then lock the locking ring and then put your sample pin stub holder and pin stub onto there then into the checking gauge unlock the ring and we drop it down to within about a millimeter and then lock the locking ring what you will see is that the post now protrudes out the bottom. This can damage the stage. So this is why you do not use the tall or long post when you're using the pin stub holder and pin stub with a sample on it. Next we need to power up the SEM. So to do that we use the switch on the right hand side and we power up the instrument. You'll hear the, the rotary pump engage and you'll see lights flashing on the front. Whenever the lights are flashing on the instrument, it means it is going towards a particular state. In this case, it is going towards the vacuum state. So when the instrument is flashing, it is working.
Next, we need to turn the computer on if it is not already on. So you can press the button on the PC. And if you are planning to use the EDX, here you can turn the EDX control on as well. If you are not planning to use the EDX, you do not need to turn this controller on. Next, you can open the FlexM1000 software by double clicking on this icon. Give it a few seconds to start up the software and you should see a splash screen in the middle here. The username is FlexM1000. There is no password, so just click start. This brings up the user interface. Once this dialog disappears, we are then going to press specimen exchange. So click specimen exchange. And what you will see is the software is now saying that the chamber is processing air, which basically means it is venting the system to allow you to put a sample in. And it has now brought up this specimen exchange procedure for you to follow. The first thing to set is the specimen stub size. So click stub size and select the top one, 80 millimeter. This is the largest holder we have and it is therefore the safest settings for the software. Click OK. And what you will see is a specimen height diagram, which is exactly the process that we have followed to mount your samples. But here is a reminder for you to set the sample specimen height one millimeter from the top of this height gauge. Assuming we have done this correctly, you can then click next. And now we need to wait for the chamber to be completely vented. Once the air light stops flashing, and you hear three beeps on the instrument, it is now ready for you to open the door and it is vented. So to open the door, take both hands, put your fingers into the holders here, and with your thumbs, push away from the chamber wall. This might require a little force if the instrument hasn't been used for a little while. But once you push away, the magnet will release and the door will slide open. Make sure that both the evac and air lights are lit white and they are solid. If you haven't opened the door all the way, you will see that the two lights flash to indicate that the door is not fully open. So open it all the way until these stop flashing. On the stage itself, you will see a copper disc that is spring loaded and you will see a flat surface here. You need to align the flat surface of the sample holder with the flat surface of the stage and you need to slide the dovetail fitting across the copper disc. So come from this side, slide it into the disc and then gently push until the two flat surfaces are mated. Next, check that you have correctly set the sample height. To do this, move the stage slowly in towards the instrument and watch this height check engage here. Your sample should move beneath the gauge without contacting it. If it makes contact, remove your sample and remount it. Again, make sure that 
Both the evac and the air lights are lit white, which indicates that the door is fully open. Now click the capture button. And what you'll see is that the stage will move underneath the camera and it will capture an image of your sample holder. Wait for the image to be captured. And if the image is okay, you may proceed. If you need to recapture it, you can click recapture. Next, we're going to insert the stage and then we're going to click the evac button. Once you've captured the image of your sample holder, you are now ready to close the door. So we bring the stage door closed and again, watch this checking gauge to ensure that it doesn't contact your sample. Bring the door all the way to the point that it first contacts and then lift it slightly and push it closed. The door should not roll backwards once you've let go. If you were to close the door and only go to the point at which you make contact and let go, you see that the door rolls open. So you need to go to contact, lift, lift it gently and then push it closed. Once you've closed the door, we are now ready to evacuate the system. So here you can choose between SEM and VPSEM. This is variable pressure. For most people, I recommend you simply start with SEM because you can always change to VPSEM during your session. So click the SEM radio button and then click evac. You will hear the pump engage. And when you do this, just gently press against the door to ensure that the door seal is made. You should hear the pump under load and you should hear that that load changes over time, indicating that the chamber is going under vacuum. This dialog will appear, simply click OK. And now we need to wait for the chamber to evacuate. Once the software indicates that it is ready for observation and you hear the instrument beep, you are now ready to power up the electron beam. First of all, we're going to check what the settings are. So to do that, come over to this panel and to this little arrow here, which allows you to pull down one of the four instrument panels that can sit in this position. The one that we are interested in is this one, the one that has the accelerating voltage on it. So click on that and then click again inside here to bring up the e-beam settings dialog. Here you can set the accelerating voltage, the spot intensity and the working distance. The first thing that we are going to check is the accelerating voltage. This can be quickly varied between one and 20 keV. For most people, generally 15 keV is perfectly sufficient. So we will use that today. If you want the highest resolution, you should go for 20 keV. If you want more surface sensitivity, you can choose 5 keV. Spot intensity is the next setting that we want to check. This one is effectively like the size of the beam, where a small number is a very, very small beam, which would give you the best resolution and is the most gentle, but the least signal. The largest number, 100, is the biggest spot, is therefore the lowest resolution, but gives you the most signal. This is also the most damaging beam. For most people, somewhere in the middle, again, is probably sufficient. If you want more signal, or if you're using the either the backscatter detector or you are doing EDX, then you could use this 80 high current mode. For now, we are going to leave it on 60 as a good middle ground. The next one to check is this working distance, which is effectively where the beam is focused. You can very quickly bring it back to five, which is what you would use typically for imaging. If you are doing EDX, you want it set to 10, and this would require you to move the stage down to 10 as well. But for just SEM imaging today, we're going to set this to five. You can then close the electron beam settings dialog. 
Now come over to the start button and click start. This will start up the beam and you'll see on the instruments and flashing lights. It will focus the beam onto the sample and attempt to give you an image. You will see here that we have something on the screen, but it, we're not quite sure what it is and we can't quite tell. But because we're using the pin stub holder, there is a hole in the center where the thread is and our pin stub is over here. So we need to navigate over towards the pin stub and away from this hole. On this image here, you can zoom in a little bit if you want to see better. And then you can single click to navigate quickly on this image to where you want the beam to be. Using the software, you can automatically adjust the brightness and contrast by clicking this button on the panel. And now we are ready to attempt to focus onto this sample. The SEM control panel is here and this gives you access to most of the settings and controls you will need while you are imaging with the SEM. The first one is magnification. This knob allows you to zoom in and out of the sample. Then the next most important is probably focus, which allows you to actually focus onto the sample. And you can see now that the image is going in and out of focus. You can also use the auto brightness and contrast button to more quickly set the gray levels on the image. You can change the scan speeds here. You can shift the image very finely with image shift here. And these knobs will allow you to do the stigmation and alignments. So to set the focus on this sample, we are going to find a part of the sample stage uh, to focus on. And here we see a bright spot. So if I double click on that with the mouse, it will center that bright spot into the image for us. I can then use the mouse wheel to scroll in, which changes our magnification. This is the same as using the magnification knob here. So this is the feature that we are going to attempt to focus on. So using the fine focus knob, I can change the focus, that's getting worse. So I go the opposite direction and that is now a lot better. Again, I zoom in a little bit more and we focus a little bit better on it again. If you feel like a feature is too bright or too dark, press the auto brightness and contrast button and that will hopefully balance out the gray levels a little for you. This feature might be a bit too bright, so we're going to find something else over here and we'll attempt to focus on this a little better. That's going out of focus. That's more closely in focus. To get a very, very sharp focus, you may need to check the stigmators here. This is just like focus as well. So if you very quickly move one in one direction until it goes out of focus, and then it bring, bring it back into a, until it is sharp again. And similarly with this stigmator as well. So shift them until you feel like they are both in focus and then check the focus again. That's a very simple, crude way of focusing with the stigmators, but for this instrument, it is often sufficient. We are now going to navigate across to the sample of interest. So I'm going to use the mouse wheel to scroll all the way out. And then I'm going to come over to the overview image here and click in the center of this screw thread sample. 
this is now very bright. So I'm going to hit the auto brightness contrast button and we can see the sample here. Now this sample is much higher than the surface we were looking at before. So I am going to change the focus to allow us to focus in on this thread sample. And now we are going to come down onto the sample a little bit by magnifying using the scroll wheel. And then again, I'm going to try and focus on the very surface. At this point now, we want to try to get a cleaner looking image. This is quite grainy because we are using the fast scan mode. The fast scan allows us to quite quickly navigate around and not have to wait for the scan to catch up. If, however, we want to capture a nice looking image, we want to go to a slower scan. So we can do that by clicking this center scan button, which says slow scan. And this now changes to a much slower raster. So the graininess in the image is removed because we are collecting a lot more data per line. If you want to change the speed at which this slow scan is going, come across again to this panel, click the down arrow and select this menu. You'll see that this is the second most slow image, but we might be sufficient with one of the faster scans. And you can see the difference between the slower and the faster scan is that it is a little bit brighter, but it's also a little bit more grainy. This will then return back to the top and sweep again from the top to bottom. If you want to capture this image, click the freeze button. This is now going to freeze at the end of this frame once the scan gets to the bottom. Once the frame is frozen, we can now capture this. An easy way to do that is by using this capture button that says direct. If it does not say direct here and you want to use direct capture, direct capture means capturing what is on the screen. You can right click on that button and change the capture type to displayed scan. Sometimes what you might see is that it is set to capture slow. What this will do is start a fresh frame, freeze and then capture it. So we're going to go back to a capture type of direct or displayed scan and then click capture. This brings up the image saving dialog. So change your folder here. So you can click select, go to MCFP SEM users and find your folder or create a new folder. Create a new folder here for the date. And then you can click save. We don't need to worry just yet about the file name. Click save. And here you can change your file name. You can change the file type, but generally TIFF would be the recommended choice. And you can decide whether or not you want to embed the data display into the image. This is this data display along the bottom. So now you can click save. And that will now save the image for you. You can go to the folders. And you'll see the image here. So this has saved the image with the data bar along the bottom, which gives you a scale bar and tells you information about the accelerating voltage as well and the detector that was being used.
once you've captured your image and you want to start scanning again, click the run button. And you see it goes back to the slow scan, so we're going to increase the speed to the fast scan. And then you can zoom back out again and perhaps find another area to focus on an image. This image is being captured with the secondary electron detector, as indicated up here by the SE. This gives you the best resolution and tends to highlight edges on features. The instrument also has a backscatter electron detector that you can access. So if you click on this part of the menu and you can select one of four different backscatter electron modes. The simplest mode and probably the most common mode that you would want to use is BSE Comp. This is a composite mode that uses all detectors on the backscatter detector. So click that and you might find that the image goes very dark. So you need to click the auto brightness contrast again and it will boost the image for you. The signal quality here is far poorer for the backscatter detector. So sometimes it would pay to either use an increased spot number here because the backscatter detector is not as high resolution as the secondary electron detector. So you could use a higher spot number to give you more signal. Or alternatively, you can slow the scan down to get rid of some of the noise. You'll notice that the backscatter electron detector image is significantly different to that of the secondary electron image. This detector highlights differences in materials because the electrons are bouncing off of the sample and coming back to the detector. So the electrons more efficiently scatter away from heavy elements than they do from light elements. Therefore, brightness in your image tends to indicate a heavier element than areas of darkness. So on this sample, if we zoom in a little bit onto this crack and we go back to a slow scan and I refocus as it's scanning, what we are seeing here is that much of the sample and much of the surface is the same material because the brightness is generally similar across the area. However, there are some patches here of darkness, and this would indicate areas where there is some contamination perhaps on the surface, and it would probably in this case be carbonaceous contamination. Note that this darkness along the cracks does not necessarily mean that this is material contrast, this is probably where we have lost some signal due to the electrons falling down into these gaps and cracks and not being detected. If we zoom in on this area, this will demonstrate it a little better for us. You can see that we now have areas here where we have brightness and darkness, indicating different materials are present. If you're having trouble needing to go between a fast and a slow scan mode with the backscatter detector, you can also use the reduced scan mode. This gives you a smaller window, which therefore scans much more quickly and allows you to use a slower scan whilst also getting enough response to allow you to easily focus onto your sample. And then you can go back to your slower scan. So now that we've found something that we're interested in, 
we could now change between the backscattered detector image, which is this one, to the secondary electron image, to secondary electron detector image, which highlights edges and not so much of the material contrast. And you can see the difference between the two detectors. Once you've collected all of the image that you wish to from your samples, you are now ready to shut down the instrument or swap your samples out. The first thing you'll need to do in either case is to stop the electron beam. So click the stop button and this will power down the electron beam. If you are going to now swap samples over, you would click the specimen exchange button and this will bring up the specimen exchange dialog box again. However, if you are simply shutting the instrument down for the day and removing your samples, you can just click the air button. This will vent the system. You now need to wait until the chamber is vented and then you can remove your samples. Just like previously, wait until the air light is solid and the instrument beeps three times and then you can open the chamber by pushing away with your thumbs again. Gently grip the base of the stage and rock it away from the flat surface here. You can then set the sample aside Then we close the door. Again, we go to the point at which it contacts, lift and close. And then to evacuate, we can simply press the evacuate button on the instrument itself. Make sure to remove your samples from the holder. So we use the Allen key to unlock the grub screw. Remove the pin stub and then disassemble the stage. We then return everything that we have used back to the SEM cabinet. Once the instrument is pumped down and you can see that the evac light is now solid, we can simply close the software and then power off the instrument. By powering off the instrument when it's pumped down means that it stays under vacuum so it stays far more clean for the next user. If you've used the EDX, ensure that you power off also the Brooker controller here.